So we are taking the idea of construction. We will have the first 3D printed town where there will be 27,000 residents after we have the three-year high school, the four-year university, and all the people that it takes to survive, our own town. Sharon Abbott, thank you so much for being on my show. How are you today? Wonderful, thank you. Sharon, uh, you had a dream uh, in the year of about 2000, right? Uh, uh, to create something big, to create something really magical and impactful. What was that dream? I had been talking to my brother at Christmas in December of 2000, and we were talking about the fact that he was adopted by my parents and how many children in the U.S., there's 200,000 children who are living on the streets without a parent or an adult to help guide them or protect them. 200,000? 200,000 under 18 years old with not a single adult to take care of them. And it, it broke my heart. And so my brother, Tony, and I decided that we would do something, which is create a school for kids at risk to help get kids off the streets from the United States. And so we were going to do a little school, 350 kids, 350 boys, because at 15 years old, there's no programs out there for these kids. You know, there's programs for six-year-olds, there's programs for 10-year-olds, you know, people will take in a 10-year-old, but not a 15-year-old. So we decided we would do something to help get these kids. They really need a break. You know, they really need somebody to champion them. And um, so I started, you know, the process of let's create something and so that became ultimate business university ubu and it's just a great acronym for you know i want kids to learn how to be themselves and then um, my brother passed away in 2008 and before he passed away i promised him that i would make this school happen and because i had so much time i sold my house my car my jewelry everything and I went all in on an investment. I have no home. I have no car. I have nothing. And of what I have is in a five by 10 storage unit. And I am 100% invested in making this school happen for kids. And I am days away. It could be tomorrow. It could be Friday. But I am days away from having the investment mature so that I can not only start a school for 6,000 boys and girls from the United States, that will be moved to Belize. So a judge will interview them and the judge will say, you can go to juvenile hall because you stole food because you're hungry or you broke into a building because you need to get out of the cold or you need to get out of the heat. Or you can go to Belize and have a three-year high school program. And at 15 years old, kids can be emancipated and they can choose what they want to do with their life. So we now will have in a three-year time period, taking 500 boys, 500 girls every six months, move them to Belize, and we have five judges across the country, and they will be able to have the most progressive education. So we'll have trade school, we'll have re required curriculum, we will have auto mechanics, we will have agriculture, horticulture, we will have animal husbandry, we'll have every practical skill there is so that these kids will always know that they can fend for themselves. And we will do things to bring them out of, imagine living on the streets and having to survive. And the defenses that kids have to, to develop to survive, right? So we will help break down those defenses so they get a chance to live their life without having anger, uh, abandonment issues, uh, all the things that come from having to live on the streets and be completely responsible for your own life. One boy I met was 12 years old. He comes home from school. His mother moved and didn't even tell him where she was going. So he has been on his own on the street since he was 12 years old. He's now 28 remarkable young man. He goes around the world and he teaches people how to make farms so that they can be self-sustaining 
creating food for themselves. That's imagine a young man doing that because he was homeless and he feels so much for people who can't take care of themselves. So that's the dream. And we are within days. I have 165 people on my team from 38 countries. We have everything from the agriculture, horticulture. We have uh, people. My farm director is from Dublin, Ireland. I have um, uh, my landscape architect is from Turkey. I have a uh, shipping uh, director who is from um, B- Mombasa. I have, I mean, it is so incredible. I have people like my COO, Tom, built the Civic Center in Las Vegas, $9 billion project. And he wants to walk away from this corporate construction world and come and help bring this project to life. I have spent four years trying to connect with people who are in um, Shanghai who have a company called Winsum. And four months ago, my guy from India, who is also part of the farming, he connected with the branch in Nigeria. And two days ago, I got the final agreement that we're going to partner so we will be able to use 3D printing to build the school. 400,000 square feet, six-story buildings in one week, inhabitable in four weeks. We can build 10, 1,500 square foot homes a day, inhabitable in four weeks. So we are taking the idea of construction. We will have the first 3D printed town where there will be 27,000 residents after we have the three-year high school, the four-year university, and all the people that it takes to survive, our own town, where we will create this, I call it neotopia, the new utopia, the way people want to live. So you don't have to lock your door. You trust the people that you live next to, that you can walk around. It's a town. So you can walk around and feel perfectly safe. Your kids are safe. You don't have to worry about somebody, you know, taking advantage of you. This is the way the world should be. This is our own neotopia, the way we want the world to be. And it starts in Belize. And then we will expand to 24 countries within 12 to 15 years. So it's a big, big project. Sharon, uh, a lot of people talk about their dreams and about their aspirations and goals. Uh, you're starting off with Christmas, uh, I guess, more than uh, 20 years ago, with a, with a dream. Uh, I'm very sorry to hear that your brother passed away, but I, I can only imagine the impact that you're having and you're going to have on so many thousands of lives, not just the impact, by the way, that it will happen when the project comes for, to fruition and they actually do it, but... I, I was tearing up here listening to to your to, to the story of how you founded this and and how this is going to touch so many thousands of youth and you know I think about a lot of the a lot of you that I see you know we're talking here about kids who really have very little a uh, very uh, unfortunate upbringing in, in their surroundings yeah they have nothing right. and you what amazes me is you know we think about the United States you know the United States has a Only three countries that are worse than we are here in the U.S. for kids dying of malnutrition before they're two years old. I mean, that is unexcusable. I mean, we have one in five adults goes to bed hungry every single day in this country. And I just did the math a couple of weeks ago because somebody made this comment that the United States is so big that the whole world population could fit into the United States. If every person in the world, eight and a half billion people lived in the United States, every single person would have a quarter of an acre. And yet, what? People are homeless. People have no food. People have no education. They have no power. They have no running water. What is the excuse for that? So we will have 28 divisions that... That address those issues all over the world so one of our first projects as we're building the school is called little Syria and we will take a million people who are in Syrian refugee camps and move them to a brand new land 3d print their entire country 
So four buildings that are that are 400,000 square feet, that's the infrastructure. We can house a million people in just two months. Then we end up building their homes with 10 printers. We can build 100 homes a day. We will teach them to be self-sustaining. They will never have to worry about another country or other people coming in to try to take over. They will be completely taken care of, but taught to take care of themselves. And why hasn't this happened before? The oldest refugee camp is in India, 1983. The oldest refugee camp. The UN has the resources. Why does that still exist? And I'm not even going to tell you the travesties that go on there because it is heartbreaking. It is disgusting. It is not human to treat people this way. So when we look at how the world has changed and, you know, thank goodness at your age, you're not aware of some of the things that have happened in the world, but we are in an age where there are a lot of us who are now going to step up and make sure that these things never happen again. So within five years, no hunger. Did you know that 100 million a year eliminates hunger around the world? Not one person would ever go to bed hungry with $100 million a year. Did you know that the Nobel Peace Prizes, the awards, are paid for through the platform that was started after World War II? If somebody put a hundred million on a platform and dedicated that to world hunger, there could be no hunger anywhere. So we will do that. Since nobody else is bothered, we will do that. So how many things can be addressed by somebody just being aware of it? Why are people homeless? Why is it in California where you are, where I am, there are no institutions since Reagan was governor to take care of people who have mental disorders. That's where a lot of our homeless come from because there's no places for them to live. So what if we create an environment, a camp, for these people to go to feel like they're outside, to feel like they have the freedom, but they have to do things to be self-sustaining, but to create an environment where they don't feel threatened. You know, and they if you if you go north to Oakland, Now, I made myself do this because I see a problem and I put myself in the center of the problem because when I'm in the middle of it, I get really creative. So I'm walking around Oakland a year ago, November, and I have to walk around three feet of trash everywhere, all along Broadway, which is a beautiful area. When Jerry Brown was governor, And when he was mayor of San Francisco, he made these areas really beautiful. He took them out of this impoverished area and he made them absolutely gorgeous. Well, they're just trash now. Weeds up to your waist. Trash everywhere. Homeless people. I walked up Broadway and had a homeless guy bump into me. And he yelled at me because he hit me from his right side and he's blind in his right eye. Like, I'm supposed to know this, you know, and it's like, why isn't somebody taking care of this man? You know, why is he living homeless on the streets? And why does he feel like he has to be so defenseless? You know, it's it's inhumane how we treat people. We treat animals better than we treat a lot of human beings. You know, we look at veterans. The idea of somebody going off, you've been there. You go serve the military and you come home and you have nothing. But maybe you have shell shock. Maybe you have PTSD. And there's a, um, a young man who played for the Oakland Raiders. And I worked with him 15 years ago. And he has PTSD and he can't hold the job. But he also played for the Oakland Raiders. So there's a dichotomy there that doesn't make sense. Like, why hasn't somebody said, okay, you don't have to be on the edge all the time and scratching every day for your survival. What else could you do? 
So I came up with a program where I'd said, why don't you go out and interview all the people you played football with, create an audio program, and then go out and speak in front of high school students and then be able to sell this. These are the famous, famous football players. He didn't have the wherewithal to do that. So I said, I'll do the interviews. He didn't have the wherewithal to be able to give me their names. And he is a well-known ex-football player. You know, people are left at the wayside. There's one person who played from the Oakland A's at the same time another person did. Vita Blue, it makes $10,000 every time he speaks publicly. The other person he worked with, Mike, who was on the Oakland A's at the same time, he's on disability. He had eight back surgeries because of baseball. He has nothing. Why is there such a disparity in the way they live their lives? Sharon, I have to say that, you know, from what we're talking about here, first of all, I, I completely agree. These are um, awful issues that, and, and I'm very inspired by the way that you're approaching them. And you're not just thinking, you're not just saying there are issues, but you're also putting yourself in the center of them and thinking creatively how to address them. One of the things that I'm taking my, for myself as an entrepreneur and on my journey, you know, talking about back to the school that, that you're creating and uh, talking about uh, the Syrian refugees, a million refugees and, and building a sustainable uh, a community to, for them to live in a matter of weeks or months. It's unbelievable. And it's a lot of it is because of technology and because of innovation, this idea that you can 3D print a community or a school. I mean, that's exactly why I came to the Bay Area after my service. And that is exactly what I... Why why I, I started this show. It's to gain perspective on what are the different ways that us technologists can leverage deep technology and 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 you know interesting technology to impact the lives of people for the better. And a lot of people can say one way to do that is through better digital transformations on our own computer screens. Another way could be to actually go and build cities and build schools. And Sharon, what you're talking about here is is literally saving lives. And and I'm gaining so much inspiration from these stories. Sharon, uh, you know I. I Obviously, the things that you're doing now are, are incredible. Uh, they're, they're completely inspiring. You have an incredible background of working with tech companies in tech. You mentioned that you've also uh, lectured at Stanford quite a few times. You were an Oprah Winfrey yeah. talking, about, talking about your projects. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about uh, where you came from. What, what excited you throughout your career? We don't have much time left, but I'd love to hear a little bit about who Sharon Abbott is. So I grew up in a very small town. There were 10,000 people in 10 square miles. And we grew the food that we ate and we traded for what we didn't grow. And you never locked a door. Everybody knew who you were. Everybody watched out for each other. And to me, that's the way the world should be. It was hard for me to adjust to being in a world that wasn't like that. And so I'm looking to bring my world, my sphere of influence back to that, where, you know, people are happy every day doing what they love to do and not doing a job just because they have to survive. You know, when I grew up, one person in the family worked and everybody was able to survive and do well. Today, two people in the family have to work and the children never see their parents. So, in the United States, children under 12, under 12 years old, 65% never see their parents other than on the weekends. To me, that's wrong. We should not put people in that position. So how, how do I take the things that I loved about growing up in the middle of Mendocino, in the town of Mendocino, three and a half miles inland, with 80 acres of state forest surrounding me, to the point where... We were free. We had fun. We knew what fun was, basic fun. And today, kids don't know so much about that because they're glued to a computer screen. They're playing games all the time. You know, I look around and I think, what are people missing out on? What inspired me, I was very fortunate. I had dyslexia. I um, stuttered. I had teachers that pulled me aside and said, if you do this, then this will be the result. My sophomore year in high school, I said, I need to go to college. And each one of my teachers said, here's your assignment. And I graduated with a 
when my sophomore year, I started out with a 2.0. The teachers made the difference. And because I have always seemed to attract people to come into my life, to inspire me, to help me, to guide me, I've had amazing mentors in my life. I have people that have opened up doors. I have managed to be on a sales team for a Fortune 500 company. I've had my own companies. I taught entrepreneur skills for 20 years only because the Chamber of Commerce in Walnut Creek asked me to run a group. And because people didn't like what was happening at the chamber, they asked me to run a group outside. And then for 20 years, that became a passion of mine to help people find out what is the right path for anybody who has a passion in their business. How do you do it more effectively, more profitably, more easily so you can spend time with your family and not spend all your time working? To me, that's what's important. I used to tell people, and I don't even know where this came from, but I didn't create it. You're born and then you die. And your life is the dash between those years. What does the dash stand for? So I was born in 1950. I'm 70 years old. I have lived an amazing life. I have accomplished amazing things. I have 10 books published. I have my pilot's license. I used to autocross race cars. I have down skill, ski, downhill ski raced, won first place medals downhill skiing. I have conquered all the things that to me, they were important. You know, they were, I today, I can still press 175 pounds with my legs at 70 years old in November. I mean, I have such <coughs> strength. Because I never saw obstacles. I saw a challenge that I could overcome. So to me, every challenge has a solution. And when people acknowledge that, yes, there's challenges in life, but that saying about it's not how many times you fall down, it's how many times you get up. That's been my life. I have managed to overcome things that most people can't even imagine. I had five times in 12 years, medical doctors told me I would not live six months. The last time was in 2012 when I, I went through breast cancer, kidney failure, liver failure, all because of a doctor's mistake. I'm here. You know, I'm here to inspire other people. I'm here to make sure that people realize the world they live in is the world they create. So we are not subject to anyone else's beliefs unless we choose to be. So whatever you want to conquer in your life, it is possible. Think about the first person who ran a four minute mile. Prior to that, it wasn't possible. Now, how many people have run the four-minute mile? So how many things could people accomplish if they only realized if somebody else has done it, you can too? Maybe if nobody's done it, you can. How many times did it take for the first space shuttle to reach the moon? They had to alter the course 1,025 times with the brilliance of all those scientists at NASA guiding that spaceship. So who are we to argue with whatever you want to do, you can accomplish? No matter what it is in the world, there are no impossibilities. There's limitations that we put on ourselves. And that's what I want the school to be, is a shining example that these kids who have been discarded, thrown away, living on the streets by themselves, have a chance to live their life in such a way that they can accomplish anything they choose. And your people like you, you're able to go to Stanford. You know how fortunate you are. There's no limit to what you can accomplish. You know, you think about um, Tesla's technology. There are going to be so many releases of Tesla's technology. We're going to see so many things become available that most of us think it's just Star Trek. Technology, right? No. Things are real. Things that we're going to see coming out in the next few years, 
We are going to be amazed at what's happening. So stay in touch. You know, do your own research. Don't believe what somebody else tells you. Don't believe what I say just because I say it. But go out and take that responsibility for yourself. Don't listen to mainstream media and think that that's the only opinion there is. You know, don't read a book and think that that is the last word. Because you have to make up your mind. You know, the beauty of living this life is that we all get to choose how we live it, where we live it, what we do. And you cannot go back at 70 years old and redo what you did at 25. So every year counts. And I am a living example of embracing every single challenge I've ever had and hitting it head on. And realizing that no matter how difficult the challenge is, there is a way to get through that and be able to make a difference in this world. And I think that's what all of us strive for. You know, Michael, it isn't what we do behind closed doors. It's what we do to influence people. Like a good word, a helping hand. I try still every single day to have one thing is a good work that I do, whether it's opening the door for an old man that would never expect a, a woman to open the door or helping somebody with their packages, or it doesn't matter how little it is, but to inspire somebody by you know, complimenting them or making them laugh, we can make the world a better place one person at a time, one day at a time. And that's what this is all about. Jill, that is just uh, inspiring. And I am so thankful for, for the fact that you're so generous with your time. So thank you very, very much. Before we end, and I'm very, very sad that we have to end, but before we have to end, I need three words that you would use to describe yourself. Innovative, determined, and creative. Jill, thank you very, very much. Uh, this was just wonderful. Stay safe and stay healthy. And I cannot wait to share this with the world. I can't wait to come visit the school myself and all the different communities that you were talking oh. about. And I can't <laughs> wait to continue Absolutely. following your journey. Wonderful, Michael. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.